Okay, so the next presenter, I would like to ask Melanie Muir from Disability Advocacy Victoria to talk about Dino's project. Welcome, Melanie. Hello and welcome. It's really good to see so many people here. I know it's hard for you to take time out of your work and to come along to things like this. And I really encourage you to use the resources that um, Daru work very hard to provide for you. Um, I, um, sorry, I represent Leadership Plus and I sit on the board of Disability Advocacy Victoria, which is the peak organisation for disability advocacy in Victoria. I have been asked to introduce Mary Mallet um, today because uh, DAV, Disability Advocacy Victoria and Leadership Plus, were very excited when Mary started talking about uh, the idea of getting down some research about why advocacy was so important. So DAV went into its wallet and started saving some coins and provided some money to Dana. Leadership Plus did the same. They gathered some money together and gave it to Dana. Um, because while we know day to day that our clients appreciate the work that we do, most clients appreciate the work that we do, um, a lot of families appreciate the work that we do, agencies that we work with appreciate some of the outcomes that we get for people. Some of the changes that are made are significant and have an impact on many people. Um, they're not always well articulated and uh, the cost benefit analysis is a way to show uh, government and others um, that the work that advocacy agencies, you and I, do every day, the value of that work. And um, it's a fantastic piece of research with um, a great odds outcome, as it turns out. Uh, so for your one dollar, you get three dollars fifty back. Um, I'd like to introduce Mary Mallet and thank her for the work that she's done in um, leading the sector. Uh, around some of the definitive ideas of advocacy and why it's so important in these times when everything seems to be challenged. Thank you, Mary. Thanks, Melanie. And it's very nice to be back at an advocacy sector forum in Melbourne. A pleasure to reconnect with lots of good people working down here in the advocacy sector. Uh, and it's always just this great reminder to me that, and, and you just need to be so aware of it, there is not an equivalent to this in any other state. There isn't a Daru anywhere else. So when, when Llewellyn was asking those questions earlier, um, you don't, I, I honestly think Victorian organisations don't realise how lucky they are that the Victorian government does fund Daru and Saru. It just doesn't happen. There isn't, there's nothing else like this anywhere else for, for the opportunity for the advocacy organisations to get together and have, you know, not huge resources, but some dedicated resources to the advocacy sector. So just make sure you appreciate it. <laughs> um, so, like Melanie said, uh, Dana had realised for some time that every time we went to talk to federal politicians or anybody, really, anybody we were trying to influence about the, the value of funding independent advocacy, there was a gap that, because we had nothing that, that, there was no proof. There was no proof either that had been, there had been no work done either in Australia or internationally um, that showed that, that had done a cost-benefit analysis of advocacy. Uh, there, there, is, there is some research around advocacy, but most of it is qualitative. It's mostly collections of stories. Um, and all, you know, all of the advocacy organisations, every year, usually in your annual report, you have a few more stories and case studies. So we've got lots of that kind of information, and we all understand that independent advocacy is important, but we had, really, we were looking for some kind of proof. Um, 
so we we had tr we had spoken to um, the De federal department of social services about this, <coughs> and over time they were coming around to perhaps thinking about funding some work. Um, and then one of my board members, Fiona May Fomaticus in Canberra, happened to be at a presentation in the ACT by this group of economists uh, who were showing a cost-benefit analysis that they did um, for an Aboriginal mediation service. And she realised they were the right people to use. So we, and the time it would have taken for DSS to make a decision, and the process we would have had to go through would have been it would have taken a long time. So we just decided to ask around in the advocacy sector um, to see if there were enough organisations who were prepared to put in a bit of money and cover the costs, and that's what they did. Um, so these are the people. Professor Anne Daly is the Professor of Economics at the University of Canberra. Um, uh, she's a member of NATSEM, which is... I can't remember what the acronym stands for. Anyway, it's the national thing that economists belong to. Uh, Greg Barrett is an economist who used to lecture at the University of Canberra. Uh, he doesn't lecture now, and he deliberately does this kind of freelance work. And then Rianne Williams was the researcher who did all the liaison backwards and forwards. Um, they were incredibly good to work with. Um, and this piece of work cost $34,000. Now, that's, I have to say, cheap <laughs> for the amount of time they spent um, and the, the result that we got, they basically, you know, it's mates rates. You know, if we were, there, there would be, you could pay three, four times that amount of money for exactly the same product, actually. Um, anyway, that, that partly it's because they sort of believe in supporting the kind of work that we're, that we're doing. So what we ended up with was, this is the full document. It's 112 pages. I only have two copies with me. Um, <laughs> Uh, Melanie did ask me, was it a mirage? <laughs> was there actually a full document at all? But it does exist, and I have two copies. Um, and, uh, and then we have the, the, ver the, par the versions that most people will use, which are, the, and they're in your papers today. So there's a two-page document. These are all on the DANA website under the publication section. Um, the, this two-page document um, is an accessible PDF, the version that's up on the website, so it can be read by screen readers. Um, and then the easy English version. So, again, because we had no spare money, this, the easy read translation was done for us by Speak Out, one of the Tasmanian advocacy organisations, um, who just did it for, as a favour for me. And, um, uh, and both of the, the... We didn't have any room, unfortunately, on the two-page summary. There, there was no room to put all the logos, so that's a shame. But on the, on the easy read and on the full document, it does have the logos of the organisations who helped to fund the piece of work. Um, and so there are three of them are Victorian, DAV, Valid and Leadership Plus. Um, ADA Australia is Queensland, that's Aged and Disability Advocacy Australia. Atticus from ACT, PWD, which does, is, is a national organisation but provides advocacy in New South Wales and Queensland. Physical Disability Council in New South Wales is PDCN. Speak Out from TAS, an AFTO based here in Victoria but a national organisation. And then there were a few others who didn't put any money in but did help considerably providing case studies and doing some of the, the work. So EDAC, which is um, an ethnic disability organisation in WA, um, Intellectual Disability Rights Service, New South Wales, Q Queensland Advocacy Inc, and Deafness Forum of Australia, who I just happened to share the office with, and so they by default <laughs> end up helping me, <laughs> which is very kind of them. Um, and so, it, 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 to my mind, it's an incredible thing that at a time when the advocacy sector itself, actually, all around the country, is fairly under threat, overwhelmed with work, Un, uh, fairly, uh, relatively uncertain of its future for many of the funding sources, but at the same time was prepared to put in bits of money they could afford to produce, you know, something um, substantial. Um, so what is cost... Oh, I should have asked first, is anybody in the room a, a trained economist? <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, when we first started this, Greg Barrett came into the Dana office and sat with me for hours on end, several times, and he, he could have been speaking a, a, a foreign language. It took me many, many meetings to, for me to get him to understand really what advocacy was about and for me to get a glimmer of understanding of what econ the language that economists use and the way they think about things. Um, but 
obviously what, what it is, is is a way of working out the value of something that you can't easily put a value to. Um, so governments use it. And you see, you, you know, now that I understand a little bit more about cost-benefit analysis, I see it, I do see it all the time in the paper. You know, just recently when, when the New South Wales government announced they're going to spend, on, I can't remember how many billions, but anyway, replacing sports stadiums that they don't need to replace, um, the, the cost-benefit analysis, analysis for that is in the negative. In other words, there is no benefit. They will, for every dollar they spend, they will lose money. Um, so that, that it, it's a useful thing to, ha to me now to have this little tiny bit of understanding that we can, because it makes this piece of work more useful if we can wave it around every time somebody, you know, a government show, demonstrates how they're wasting money. Um, so th this is the uh, economist speak stuff about the, um, so that term, the, the aggregate NPV, the NPV is the net present value of independent advocacy. The way, so what they do is they put, they attach a monetary value to the work that advocates do. And they do that by looking at how much it saves in the systems um, that advocates work in. So in, in the, the larger document, and I do recommend that it's worth, this can be your holiday reading for all of you, okay? When you're sitting on a beach somewhere, you can take a copy, print out a copy of this and take it with you. Um, because what they, the, this is the way they do it, is they, they work out all these values, they cost them 10 years ahead into the future. Now, don't ask me why they do any of these things, I'm just telling you what they do, okay? They, they work out how much it costs for 10 years into the future, they then discount that, because it's something they keep telling me that a dollar you spend in the future is worth less than a dollar you spend today, but anyway, whatever. Um, and, and then they, um, they use a thing called sensitivity analysis. All, all of these, they do all of these things, each of which brings the value down. And the, the whole point of that is because um, as a piece of research and a piece of work, if, it, if we are overstating the value of what advocacy does, then it can be dismissed. So anybody who's actually a trained economist, if we said, if, if they, if they said, right, for every dollar you spend on advocacy, government save ten dollars. Now, economists would say that's ridiculous. That's not possible. So, they because they understand that there are all these other factors that come into account. So anyway, they use all of these other um, ways of discounting uh, that that are. They don't just make it up. Okay, economy. Econ economics is a, a discipline uh, that has its own rules, it has its own language, it has its own way of doing things. So they, in here, there are pages, if you want to read it, <laughs> about, that describe exactly the, the methodology that they follow. I don't understand it, and I won't bore you by trying to read it out. You just have to be assured that it is valid. Um, so, it, but, so then they looked at what advocates, they looked at those, um, the, the data they used actually was the the federally funded organisations, so the National Disability Advocacy Programme, the NDAP data. They have to use something that's in the public domain. And the last time that DSS made that available publicly was 2013 to 2014, that data. So that's what they had to use. Now that's a few years ago, and it means that there weren't very many NDIS issues, for instance, being looked into, being advocated on at that time. Um, what it means ideally is we would do within another couple of years, we would do some kind of update to this that re-looked at the same issues but included more NDIS issues in it. Um, it it does, doesn't make much difference though to the, it makes no difference to the value outcome thing. Um, and actually I should just point that out first. Uh, I think I did, yeah, I just separated it out a little bit on, the, on this next slide um, because that, that the middle sentence there about the benefit cost ratio being 3.5 3 to 1, uh, which is high compared to other investments. Now, the way that's put, prefer myself, I like reading the easy read version <laughs> because it's, it's, uh, it's in words of one syllable. Um, and it makes sense to me. And so, and we had to think about, it was the economists had never done something before where they had to explain something in easy read information about what they do. So they found it in incredibly interesting as well um, that in that, so this, you do have this in your papers, um, 
uh, trying to work through how you explain to people with intellectual disability, who this is primarily aimed at, about um, what it, a sort of a translation of the main elements in the document, but then what it is, uh, there's a useful thing, which is one of the pages, is a good description in Easy Read about what advocates do, actually, that we only discovered that afterwards. It wasn't an intention, it just worked out like that. So I've separated that out and put it on our website and called it What Do Advocates Do? Because it's useful. Um, but then it just describes uh, where you know advocates get money. They come from, comes from the Commonwealth or some from your state or territory government, except in South Australia, where they don't fund any state-funded advocacy. And that governments have to pay for a whole lot of other things. Um, and that what economists do is they help governments work out if they're getting a good deal. Um, so that the economists found that for every dollar the government spends on advocates, they save $3.50 for everyone in the community. Because that's, it's $3.50 that they don't have to spend on other systems. Um, this, when we, in our explanation of this, we have imagine if you saved a dollar with the bank and the bank paid you three fifty for saving the money with them, you'd be getting a very good deal. The initial way the economist used, described that was imagine if you gave a dollar to your advocate and they gave you three dollars fifty back and I made them take that out. I said, I don't want every advocate being hounded by their clients to ask them for three dollars fifty. So anyway, um, we changed that. Uh, but it is, it is a, a nice, clean way to explain it. And the two-page summary has far a lot you know, more in, in depth um, about describing what a cost-benefit analysis does and why they discount it into the future. The only bit, to be perfectly honest, the bit that we will all use over and over again is that the bit in the middle, the bit about the, the ratio of 3.5 to 1. If they've got it in... Um, uh, at the end, actually, if, if, if you do want, if anybody wants some information about why that's a good outcome, um, they describe that at the bottom of this two-page summary. So um, in a recent OECD publication, um, a ratio below one is considered poor, a ratio between one and one and, a, one and a half is low, between one and a half and two is medium, and a ratio above two is high. Uh, and that, that stuff comes from... Um, that's a, a World Bank estimate. So the World Bank, when they're funding things, this is what they say. Anything above a ratio of one to two is high. So that's why it's, it demonstrates that it, it's a good outcome. In the, in the larger paper, the useful, it, it's useful for lots of things. It, it has case studies scattered through it. Um, and to highlight the particular systems, uh, they, they were all longer case studies that were shortened and abbreviated. Um, if I was to do this again, I would prefer to do them in another way. They're a bit clinical and analytical, and I'm a bit personally a bit uncomfortable that we've described people and their issues uh, in this very objective clinical sort of way of looking at them. I think if we, if we do an update or some other work on this, we would work with people with disability and get them to describe their, their issues in the way they want to describe them. So that would be a change I would do for another time. Um, so the, the, um, there are a couple of ways you can do these things. So we've scattered case studies through it, but we didn't, we didn't cost out each case study. That's, you'll sometimes see work, similar work done in that way, where every step, because it's a way you can, you can work out how much a piece of advocacy costs, you can work out how many hours an advocate has spent on an issue over six months or a year or whatever it is, and then how much, um, you know, the actual direct cost of that piece of advocacy versus the savings for the system. It, it wasn't how this was done, that it was done using publicly available data on all of the different systems. Um, and of course, the systems where you save the most money are the more expensive systems. So the health system and the justice system by far and away are the expensive systems. So the work that advocates do in those areas are the ones that demonstrate the value. We deliberately, um, we wanted this to be available and, and useful for every advocacy organization. So in the case studies, we took out, um, some of them say what state or territory they were in, but they don't reference what advocacy organization it was or what type of advocacy, and that's deliberate because we want everybody to be able to pick up and use this and not, not 
not for other people then can't they can't say oh but that was X organization or that you don't advocate like that or whatever so we've made it as much as possible we've made it uh, fairly unidentifiable so that it's useful for everyone um, one of the other useful things about this document he the, the Greg when he got into it um, just researched he has a bibli bibliography in the middle of it that goes for pages it has every piece of research about advocacy that's ever been done in every country, mostly English speaking, but there's a couple from other countries as well. Um, it's incredibly useful. And I think what will happen over time is we will be able to get more um, pieces of research done by students, uh, master students or PhD students, to pick up and do some more research on advocacy. And he's done, I mean, they almost don't have to do a literature review to start, he's done it. So that's, it's useful. Uh, uh, Unfortunately, in the advocacy sector, there's so little time for any of this um, that, you know, I, I keep thinking, oh, I must go and look at that, I must read it, and I just haven't got time. But I'm very pleased that he has pulled it together and that all of us will be, over time, will be able to go back and look um, to see um, those, the, those pieces of work. Um, um, so, yeah, he's, he's shown in there how each, in each of those systems he's costed exactly why advocacy saves um, the police or saves the courts or saves um, money for all the systems. Now, most of those systems are state systems. So it's actually the state governments that, the, that advocacy generally is saving the money for. Uh, I mean, the money, you know, does flow through from the Commonwealth, but, you know, it's, it's in the state, the state budgets that those systems are are funded out of, um, and that's whether or not it is state-funded advocacy or federally funded advocacy, because there is no difference. The work that's done is exactly the same. We didn't particularly highlight that in here, um, and you know, Llewellyn's presentation earlier on about the data was interesting, because in most, most states, there is almost no, in the state funding advocacy sector, there is almost no data because most, many of the states don't collect it at all. So Victoria does collect quite a bit and um, it has been gathered together and by, by Daru and under Vicos to, to present the information back again. But that's not true in most other states. We, and that's why we had to use the NDAP data. Um, but that also isn't perfect. The NDAP data has never asked the gender. There is no data in the federal funding about what gender the clients are. That's madness, isn't it? But they've never asked, so nobody's ever told them. Now, the advocacy organisations have it in their databases, so we could go back and ask them, but for some peculiar reason, it's never been asked. Um, right, I, there's uh, plenty of other things I want to mention. So, just, is there any questions anybody would like to ask about um, the process or what we found out or uh, anything else? Otherwise, I'll go on to how it's being used. So, um, because Dana has almost no money, we haven't done any kind of flash big event to launch this thing. We're sort of launching it sequ sequentially in every state. We had a, um, a bit of a launch at the Atticus AGM in Canberra, um, and the economists, because they're based in Canberra, were able to come and speak to it. They are happy to do media. So if you do want to, if any of the Victorian organisations or Daru or DAV or anybody else wants to use it in some way, including in the media, then Professor Andaly is perfectly happy to do media interviews and to talk about you know, the, the economics side of it. Um, we, will, we will try and get her to do some of that uh, at a national level. Um, but it is already being used by the state by the, the advocacy organisations in the states that are campaigning about their advocacy funding. Um, and in actual fact, a draft version of it that we provided into DSS was shown, this is some time ago now, was shown to the Minister's office and helped to get across the line that the NDAP funding should be extended out for another couple of years. And that was even, that was an early draft. That wasn't, we were nowhere near finished at that point. But the current federal minister is uh, is an economist. He's an economist and a lawyer. So I think um, there are reasons why why you need these things because um, some of the people who make the decisions do understand what this value is about. 
Um, however, the other lesson that we're learning now as the organisations start to use it for lobbying is that what, what we've done and created is a piece of what we would see pr as proof of the value of advocacy. But politicians don't necessarily make evidence-based decisions, do they? They make political decisions, depending on what particular marginal seats want or whatever it is, you know. Um, so what I'm sort of realising is, even though this is useful and will be useful, it's just one little part of the toolkit that we need for lobbying governments to persuade them to keep funding advocacy. So we've got we've got stories and we can use stories um, and have individuals with disability ideally who will are prepared to speak up on behalf of the advocacy sector because it, it from a politician's perspective when they get a group of advocates to come come and talk to them they they think it's a bit self-serving they think oh this is just the advocates wanting to maintain their jobs or something um, so um, and you'll see, I'll, I'm going to show you something in a second about what the in, interstate organisations are doing around campaigning about their funding, because um, they've taken two different angles on it. Um, I'll just, I'm just going to show, this is a terrible slide really, I apologise in advance for it because it's not terribly clear. But this is the picture of advocacy funding in Australia. Is this thing? So, um, this along the second last line from the bottom is that's the National Disability Advocacy Program from DSS, the federal funding. So that's $18 million a year, um, extending out to, um, well, it currently ends at June, end of June 2020. But anyway, we're, that, that is ongoing at the same level. Um, it was $16.5 million. It's only relatively recently gone up to $18 million. That does not include the end... end the NDIS appeals funding, that's separate and it's not used, it's not available for generic advocacy anyway, so I haven't put it in there. Um, so then this column down here, this is the funding that is, I dated that September, it's the same today. Um, uh, the funding that is available in every state and territory for advocacy, um, but it's, uh, it, it's under a category called advocacy, information and print disability. And um, it's all in almost every government signed it over in their bilateral agreement to go back to the Commonwealth. In Victoria, that was done a little bit differently because the money was broken up a bit differently. I'll come to that in a second. Um, but, so it means as the NDIS rolls out fully in every state, that money disappears. Um, so I'll... I'll New South Wales, it's $10.9 million, plus there's an extra couple of million, which is provided to some of the organisations that are called state peaks. So Physical Disability Council is one, New South Wales Council for Intellectual Disability, um, P People with Disabilities, um, PWDA, some of their funding, uh, New South Wales funding is, a, is as a state peak. So it's about another two million. So in, in New South Wales, it's about $13 million. That all stops at the end of June next year. And so they are busily campaigning. They're using this cost-benefit analysis as one of the things that they are trying to demonstrate to the New South Wales government why they should keep funding them. But they've also started some campaigns. They've, so they've, got, they've formed um, an alliance, the New South Wales Disability Advocacy Alliance. Uh, they're on Twitter as at Stand By Me New South Wales. They've formed this, so there's a website, standbyme.org.au, and this is their logo thing, banner, Stand By Me, Don't Ditch Disability Advocacy. Um, New South Wales Council for Intellectual Disability had their own campaign that they were planning anyway, which is called Don't Silence Us. So they have postcards that you can send back. They, on, on this Stand By Me, there's one of those change.org petitions. Um, New South Wales, the CID have an a similar thing under the Don't Silence Us one. They're, they're all, they are all part of the Stand By Me, it's just they've got their own thing happening as well. Um, but what's happening is the government won't engage with them. So it's very difficult to advocate and fight about an issue if you can't get at the people that you want to advocate to. So the New South Wales Minister has stopped meeting with any of them, the New South Wales Premier won't meet with them, 
Um, New so the, the New South Wales Minister doesn't generally respond to the media. He gets the, the department to respond and they spout complete rubbish all the time and they just say that there will be increased funding for disability advocacy when the NDIS comes in. It's not true. It isn't true and the, the organisations keep refuting it and he, you know, I, I, one of them described to me recently just before he's kind of stopped meeting with anyone, they had a 45 minute meeting with him and he said some stuff and they had to keep saying, with respect minister, and then they would tell him the truth. And then he'd say some other piece of rubbish and they'd say, with respect minister, and that, you know. So that, that's how things are going. And in New South Wales, there isn't an election. So they have no, there's no reason for the government. There's nothing that's gonna force the government to change its mind, um, except continual lobbying, but, and, and that may, you know, I think everybody in New South Wales, in the organisations and myself, we can't actually believe the government will drop it. But they may make the organisations keep fighting so, so that it gets so close to the end of June next year, and as you can imagine, their boards are having to make decisions now, you know, as to what do they do with their leases, what do they do with their staff, do they, you know, now put them, you know, give them all three months notice and they all have to finish, whatever. So they, they're, they're having to make these decisions now. And the, there's, the contrast to that is what's happened in, in Queensland. Oh, sorry, one other thing is that the, the New South Wales organisations are arguing for, for all of the money. So the, they want to try and keep all of that money. Of the 10.9 million, about 6.5 million is used by organisations that we would all consider our advocacy or advocacy and information organisations. The rest of it is given to other organisations, some of which are providers, but like the Deaf Society of New South Wales is an example. It's quite a big provider, and it is registered under the NDIS, and that's where its business will be. But they traditionally have always had some information service money through the New South Wales government. Um, anyway, they're trying to fight to keep the whole lot of it. In Queensland, um, the organisations there um, have set up a website called advocacymatters.org, uh, they just used um, they just used, used this the slogan advocacy matters, uh, but they've they've got a couple of fancy orange things on their website. But New, but Queensland of course has just had an election, so that meant the Queensland organisations had you know they had a, a way of getting at the politicians. However, so Queensland is 13 million, but only about two million is actually given to direct advocacy organisations. So those advocacy organisations got together and they, they just argued for their bit of it. They didn't try and argue for the, the whole money. They just argued for the bit that was going to the advocacy organisations. Now, they've had a win in that Anastasia Palaszczuk's government has just got in again and they did get an election promise out of her to continue advocacy funding for 4.1 million. It's not entirely clear what that'll include and we don't know how long it'll go for. But anyway, they're in a better position than New South Wales is. However, if you, if you consider that all of the rest of that money was in some way being used for some kind of systemic advocacy by, and the kind of organisations would be, say, the MS societies or the epilepsy associations or the autism associations or those broader groups that don't do necessarily individual advocacy like your organisations do, but they're still part of the bigger picture systemic advocacy for people with disability. So there's still a significant loss in Queensland um, that, that will happen as of end of June 2019. Western Australia, I've left it in because we have no idea what they're doing. Um, they, Western Australia tendered out their advocacy a couple of years ago. They don't fund systemic advocacy. They consciously, deliberately don't allow any Western Australian state-funded organisation to do systemic advocacy. Complete ban. They have to only use it for individual advocacy. Um, and they are reviewing it now. Um, doesn't appear to be public. We don't know how, how they're reviewing it. So we, I've left it in, but I don't know if it'll continue. We hope it, hope it does, but don't know. South Australia, um, South Australia, there's 1.9 million, which will disappear at the end of June, but it's not, none of those are individual advocacy organisations. It's, again, the sort of broader spectrum of organisations. Again, same in Tasmania, 2.3 of which about a million goes to advocacy organisations, and again, stops at the full rollout end of June 2019. ACT, um, the 1.4 million, it's continuing at the moment on a 12-month basis, so I've left it in there, but it may not, we don't know if it'll keep continuing. 
And that, again, none of that is for individual advocacy. Um, it's small amounts to small organisations uh, like PWD, ACT, but I mean tiny amounts of money. Um, Northern Territory, a small amount of money anyway, and again, we'll stop at the full rollout. So, so you can see that the total amount of money right now that's being spent in the broad advocacy sector of 63.4 million across the country, um, dropping down to 28.6 here, uh, I need to add the Queensland 4 million back in there, so that'll bring it up to about 30. But anyway, it's a huge loss overall at a time when the sector, you know, this, the NDIS is, is causing this, you know, amazing shifts in the sector. People with disability are floundering and, and their families absolutely floundering and struggling with dealing with the new system. And it's not as if all the other systems have magically got better. Of course, you know, <laughs> they're, just, they're just as bad as ever. Um, and it's extremely difficult to get any attention on this because, because it's a joint um, national and state and territory issue. So the person who, well, I suppose the federal government care, you know, in their own way. <laughs> um, so they, what they've done is they've extended their funding. They haven't put any extra money in it, but they have at least extended it out until June 2020. And it provides a little bit of security for those organizations. Because what they were, had been going to do was they had been going to tender it out. So they pulled back from that and at least have continued it and provided a little bit of security. And what the, and if, I don't know if any of you remember, but um, uh, when they announced that, they, um, it came out, there was a media release came out from Minister Porter and, and Minister Prentice, uh, Jane Prentice is, is the disability minister, Christian Porter is the senior cabinet minister, um, and they put out a fairly strongly worded uh, media release, a bit unusual from a federal minister actually, because they were saying to the state governments, you have to keep funding this, and they praised the Victorian government, which must have nearly killed him to do that, but he did. He praised the Victorian government for continuing to fund advocacy. However, not long after that, I discovered to my horror that the Victorian, because I'd been presuming everything was safe in Victoria, and it isn't true, because in Victoria, the total amount of money spent in advocacy, information, and print disability is 9.1 million, but the amount this 2.9 is what sits under the Office for Disability. So that's the, is it 22 organisations that are funded under the Office for Disability, yep. So it's straightforward advocacy. But this money includes, some of, the, some of them are the same organisations actually, and then some are other organisations, that have funding that happened, just happens to sit under a slightly different category. They're under the, and for anybody who's interested, it's in the National Minimum Data Set, um, 6.01 is advocacy, 6.02 is advocacy and information. They just, there would be no particular reason why some of the organisations got their funding or classified under one or the other. But, and, and Victoria was the only state that at some point, and I don't know the history of this, at some stage it got split up in Victoria and the straightforward, pure advocacy maybe, we call it, went to the Office of Disability and the rest of it sits somewhere else and is going to disappear. Um, so even though, you know, I hear and see your minister patting himself on the back continuously about how supportive he is about advocacy, and it's true that he is, but, but there is still, you know, six million dollars of the broader sector funding, which includes some organisations, I don't know if anybody in the room, but certainly some that are losing, um, so an organisation that, yep, Oh, do you want to go and get a, grab a microphone? That's right. Um, the impact's quite significant because there are some agencies who are very small and rely on that information yep. money. So that information money is going. And so they'll be left with 0.4 of what they've had in their budget. Um, and they can't employ the staff or pay their rent. So the significance of the withdrawal of those funds could potentially and does potentially mean for a number of organisations that they will not be able to continue to provide a service and will close. Yeah, so I think we, we actually need to 
in, for Victoria, literally pull that together, work out exactly which organisations are at risk. Um, and some of them may be organisations who it, it actually are service providers and therefore they'll, you know, their clients will move into the NDIS, they'll be covered sufficiently under there. But we do need to find out pretty soon which are the information and advocacy organisations that are actually at risk. And because this money won't be replaced by anything else. So the NDIS doesn't fund, obviously doesn't fund advocacy in people's plans. And the ILC is the thing that, that all the state governments who, ha who are taking this money away, they've kept saying to the advocacy organisations, oh, but you can get money under the ILC. So the ILC, anyway, isn't available yet in Victoria. It will be by next year. Right now it's open in New South Wales, South Australia and ACT. But it's a limited pool of money and it's, it's, it's open, only part of it, I was discussing this with Anna earlier on, and only part of it anyway is available for information because it, it does a range of other things. And it's extremely competitive. If you, look at the, if you look at the lists of who got ILC funding for the first couple of rounds, uh, there, were, there were a couple of the advocacy organisations did indeed get project funding. But it is just a project. It's not recurrent. They can do some good work, but it's, it doesn't replace recurrent funding. Um, and the other organisations that got it were universities, for example. Um, I know quite a few um, more sort of corporate or business organisations that are now starting to apply for ILC. Um, so it's... <sighs> Anyway, it's, it's problematic. The ILC clearly won't be enough money. And what there was a sort of a gap, something that didn't happen exactly in the transition to the ILC, which was the state governments were meant to provide to the NDIA in detail who they funded and what they funded them for so that the ILC people inside the NDIA, I think, could do some mapping about what stood, what was at risk of being lost. Some of the governments did that well and some did it very badly. And New South Wales, I think, in particular, provided almost nothing, well, I, I think. I don't know about Victoria. Um, anyway, it just it doesn't match up. And one of advocacy and information is one of the things that is kind of disappearing into this hole, really, because the ILC doesn't fund advocacy. It's excluded. Um, yeah, anyway, it's... it's so, the, so what I find when I try and discuss this stuff with the NDIA, the senior people in the NDIA, that they, they look at it with interest, but... It's not their responsibility, because they were never meant to fund advocacy. So they, they think, oh, yes, that's interesting, <laughs> and that's, that's it. <laughs> and, and at the federal level, the federal government say, oh, but we've done our bit. We've extended our funding for the next couple of years. We can dust our hands and be, you know, pat ourselves on the back. And then the state governments who are withdrawing their funding, they just say, but it's part of our bilateral agreement. We're handing the money over. You know, we're, they are all, of course, winding up their disability departments so everybody who works in their departments and who knew anything about anything, including advocacy, will be gone. So it, 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 it's... Anyway, it, it comes down to this kind of political fight, um, which, by the look of it in Victoria, you'll ha you're going to have to pick up and do as well to work out how much of that $9 million is going to have an impact um, and the organisations who will be at risk will then have to pick up and start doing... start campaigning. And I think... I think you do have an, um, you have an election in Victoria next year, somebody said about a year away. So that's good. That's actually the perfect opportunity to get election promises out of both sides that, um, that they will continue funding that information funding. Um, but what you can't do is you can't let the Victorian government keep getting away with saying, oh, but we, we're, we're good, you know, we're saving advocacy, because it's only part of the picture. They have to understand what's going to be, what's going to be lost. Um, anyway, this, so any, any of you who are interested in this stuff, I'm very happy for anybody to contact me to discuss it further if you're interested in campaigning, lobbying, any of the influence stuff, um, because it's difficult in every state. It's, this stuff is, isn't easy. It's hard to find allies, and um, it's hard to get the ear of people. And so that's a very long-winded way of coming back to the thing about the cost-benefit analysis is just... It's one useful thing to be able to show these politicians to say, at, you, you know, we need you to provide, keep funding this money, and we're showing you that, that it is good value. But they make decisions based on many other reasons, and the, the cost-benefit analysis just means that it's one less thing that they can kind of wriggle out of, because you are showing them 
a solid, valid, validated um, piece of evidence that shows that they are not wasting their money when they fund disability advocacy. That, you know, it's about the best you can do, really. Um, there's something else that I want to mention, um, which is, um, and I'm going to, I don't know if you, any, if some of you know Patrick from AFTO, but Patrick McGee is the policy and advocacy manager at AFTO, and Patrick and I have been very heavily involved for the last little while around the National Disability Insurance Scheme Quality and Safeguarding Commission. Um, I'll just going to show you some stuff. So, some of you may have paid attention, some of you may not have, but there's a quality, NDIS quality and safeguarding framework that came out um, oh, a, a year ago, actually, just early December last year. And they had done consultations and stuff. There's a whole lot of information in there. Some of the stuff about advocacy is peculiarly written, but um, anyway, that was the framework. And then what they've been doing since then is DSS have created the amendments to the NDIS Act to bring into being the Quality and Safeguarding Commission. Um, now, I know, I, I, I know in Victoria you have to kind of split yourselves in two when you think about this stuff because the Victorian government is doing its own quality and safeguarding work as well. I, I, I know that. That's not quite the same because everywhere else, basically all the other state governments are just handing over to the Commonwealth, basically, but Victoria isn't. Victoria's pushing hard on its own quality and safeguarding, so somehow you have to... Divide your brain in two and think about the federal stuff, the Quality and Safeguarding Commission, and then separately think about how the Victorian system is, is playing out as well. Uh, so this is just about the, the, um, the federal one. So the Quality and Safeguarding Commission, uh, this legislation was meant to go before the Senate last week and they pulled it at the last minute and then, anyway, it'll probably come up this week or next. I'm looking at Patrick because he might know, maybe. But I, anyway, it basically has to be passed before the end of the year because they have to get this Quality and Safeguarding Commission up. If you see up there, South Australia and New South Wales are the two states who by 1st of July 2018, the NDIS will have fully rolled out. It already has, of course, in the ACT. But So that means by the 1st of July next year, this Quality and Safeguarding Commission has to be in existence. So they have already started recruiting the the positions. So there will be an overall commissioner, the Quality and Safeguarding Commissioner. Then underneath him or her, there will be three roles, uh, the National Complaints Commissioner, the National Registrar, and the National Senior Practitioner. So the, the National Complaints Commissioner will deal with complaints, obviously, um, and the um, Registrar will deal with the registration of providers plus with serious incidents and then the senior practitioner will deal with restrictive practices except except only in a, uh, a role modeling kind of way so organizations will still have to if, if a service provider in Victoria wants to use restrictive practices they have to apply to the Victorian system to get those restrictive practices authorized and then they have to notify the national senior practitioner that they've done that and there'll be a circular kind of process. Uh, and then the other, the other main function thing that's still staying at state level is worker screening. So worker screening will still be being done in every state by that state's current system, though I think they'll all move to being more like each other. Uh, so there are, so the legislation is done more or less. A lot of the work that um, we have been doing in the background is lobbying basically to get some amendments to the legislation, in particular um, to get independent advocacy written into the bill. And it hasn't gone through Parliament yet, but I think we feel like we've had a victory. <laughs> um, they have now drafted several places where independent advocacy will get written into the bill and there will be a definition of independent advocacy in the bill. So that's, it's a big achievement because independent advocacy in Australia is not written into legislation in many places at all. So. Anyway, fingers crossed it'll go through without too much hassle, but um, and uh, once it's proper, as I said, it's still in the background because these are amendments that are to go through and they have to be, but they're sort of agreed in the background at the moment, so it looks like they will go through. 
But then the next thing that happens is the legislation, in many places in the legislation, it just says this legislation may have rules to do with whatever. And there are bundles of these rules which are, have a lot of detail in them. They're, avail they're out now for limited circulation. Now, so they're not up on the DSS website for circulation, but however, any of you who are interested in looking at any of these rules, I am perfectly happy to email them to you and get you to give me some feedback. We have to have the feedback back to DSS by the 14th of December. But there are, so there are rules about the NDIS Code of Conduct. Um, there is a consultation report about the Code of Conduct. Um, there's, there's draft guidelines for workers and draft guidelines for providers, I think, around the Code of Conduct. And there's rules about the con Code of Conduct. There is a set of rules about protection and, dis and disclosure of information. There's provider registration and practice standards, and there is another document that is the practice standards. Um, there's the complaints rules. There's incident management and reportable incidents. There is provider, another, yeah, provider registration and practice standards, and behaviour support rules. Um, so these, the, you know earlier on, so when we were having the discussion earlier, and, and one, somebody was saying about how they wish there was a place where, you know, you could easily get all of the, the, the legislation and the rules that you needed about a, an issue that you were working on. Well, this process has kind of made me realise that um, this is just one thing. This is just the rules about this one commission, you know, um, and they are, there's an enormous amount of detail, um, and yet advocates, once they're all in place, advocates will be dealing with this every day, on an everyday basis, about clients that you've got who have complaints about that need to go to the commission, um, or when there's critical incidents or whatever it is. So advocates will be, reportable incidents, I mean, uh, advocates will be involved in all of this. Um, and, and the behaviour support rules are um, a particular one that, that uh, they, I think I, what I had heard that they did them once, sent them out, or at least did limited circulation and then pulled them back in because they um, were completely wrong, I think, and they've now come back out again. Um, so there's a whole lot of stuff here, Patrick and I, and the, the other person we're working with is Therese Sands from the DPOA, Disabled Persons Organisations Australia. Therese is from PWD originally, but now with DPOA. Um, and we are wading through this stuff, and um, Patrick has coordinated a meeting with the unions sometime soon to get our heads around where we are on the same page, which mostly we are uh, on, on some of these issues. Um, but. It, so if anybody has any interest, in, you know, you don't have to read all of them, but if you're particularly interested in the complaints or in the behaviour support or the critical incidents, you know, this um, what is reportable incidents one, um, I'll email it to you, you can read it, share it among your, the advocates at your office and, you know, but, uh, but also I'm happy to send you the whole lot. As I said, they, they, the department, they write limited circulation on the top, I can't put them up publicly, we, we can't, they, they don't go out publicly for this, but they are happy, I think, for us to send them to people who are interested. So please, even if you only want to read one of them and then come back and give me two comments on it, I would be grateful for any input from... Because, because you will end up having to deal with this stuff. Um, and I am aware, as I said, in Victoria that it's a bit more complicated here because the Victorian government's doing its own... Uh, has a, a different way of looking at some of this, um, which I think is because they want to influence the way the other, probably the way this national thing operates and the way the other states and territories are doing things. What isn't, what I don't have, uh, I don't have a clear picture in my mind at the minute of, um, of what happens in Victoria when this Quality and Safeguarding Commission comes into place. So I'm not sure that, the, because in every state and territory the system is different. So for instance, I don't know whether the the Disability Services Commission in Victoria, does that just slide over, does it wind up basically? I, I, my expectation is that it will because it seems to me that the functions that the Disability DSC, Disability Services Commission, that's the name of it, isn't it? The functions that that does will be replaced by the functions of this new commission. But so in some states, some of those functions are done by the ombudsman and the ombudsman would continue because they do other things. So it, it, it's something that somebody somebody who has any time needs 
put together, ideally for Victoria, what is going to happen? What's the transition process? And I don't know, is there a, there must be, there must be a Victorian NDIS transition something, advisory group or a thing, a committee or something, is there? Are any of you on it? <laughs> where, where does it sit? In must be something. Anyway, think about it and see, see if you can find, because that, that it's, it's important, it's particularly important for advocates to know clearly as this new commission comes in, what is it replacing and where would you now be taking particular complaints to. So this Quality and Safeguards Commission, will, it, it's to deal with complaints about service providers. It doesn't deal with complaints about the NDIA or the LACs. Because the local area coordinators are partner agencies under the commission, they are treated as if, sorry, under the agency, they're treated as if they were the NDIA, and so the complaints about them have to go to the Commonwealth Ombudsman. As I'm saying this, I'm realising there's something that's needed, which is, uh, yeah, a proper, some better flow charts about where things go, yeah. I, I'm, I'll just contemplate how we start doing that, but, but they'll be different everywhere, because the existing systems are different everywhere. But anyway, that's, but, but that's not what's happening right now. What's happening right now is the details of these rules, and um, I, I don't have paper copies I can give away. I've only got one of each one. Um, but you're, ha you know, you're welcome to flick through them, and I'm very happy to email you any of them that you're interested in. Anybody got any questions? <laughs> Jeff? Yep. Don't want, to oversimplify, uh, don't want to oversimplify, but um, if the New South Wales government has, as part of their bilateral agreement, passed the funding across to, to the federal government, isn't the simple answer that the, the pressure should be on the federal government just to, at the very least, top up NDAP in that state to, to match and, and to just say nationally they should commit to having a program which takes up the state programs? Is that oversimplifying it or is it...? Um, I mean, it's a perfectly legitimate and simple point. However, the, the federal government, it, because this is a program that's always been jointly funded by states and commonwealths, and the federal minister and department are completely aware that most of the systems that advocates work, support people, you know, to navigate, are state-based systems. So they are federally pretty aware that therefore those state governments should maintain their responsibility of funding this work. So they don't want to let them off the hook. It, I, I know what you mean, there's like, there's a, and it will come to this point around the New South Wales stuff, that if, as soon as the, as soon as the federal government said, okay, we'll top up the New South Wales stuff, then the New South Wales government would say, oh great, we're off the hook now. That, that's it. And all of the other state governments would immediately do the same thing. They would immediately not be open to, um, the state-funded organisations but, coming to them. So it, it but may... The federal, but if the federal government did the funding appropriately, would it matter? It wouldn't matter, except that it means the federal government... No, it wouldn't matter. Um, and it, and it, at an earlier stage, it sort of was... That's kind of what I expected would happen, I think, at an earlier point a couple of years ago. What I quickly learned was the federal government has no, no appetite at all to increase the funding for advocacy in any way. So they are, what they are determined is to make the state governments. So, so there's, both, there's both a monetary thing and a philosophical thing, if you could call it that. Maybe it's, it's not philosophical in governments, it's just political. Mm. It's just about not letting the state governments get away with not funding something that they should fund. It does mean those state governments have to find new money, but they find new money all the time for other things. Mm. So it's, it's, it's just, it's a matter of where their priorities are. But, but as a tactic, if, if nationally everyone was shaming one person, one minister in the federal government to fix it, rather than trying to get seven governments to fix it, might that be more effective? I, I'm not, uh, I don't know. Just it's the federal government could be hard to shame. <laughs> <That's right>. yeah, <laughs> apparently, yes, that's um, true. Um, so many other things they're not ashamed about, they should be, so yes. Yes, so, uh, it, and that's, but it is an interesting thing because this isn't, it's not even to do with the colour of the politics, you know, at the moment, the current state governments, six of them are Labour governments. But, so it's not, you know, it's, it's the thing that is difficult to even get your head around when you think about this politically. It, the governments uh, of the same political party can hold different views federally as they do at the state, state level. It, it, 
so yes, I agree, Jeff. That this, there feels like it does feel like there could be potentially the simple solution is to make the state government increase the funding. Uh, but it, yeah. One of the issues is that the Commonwealth are running a business that they've never run before. And so many of the things that are happening now will only ever happen now. And once we're through them, it'll be a bit different. But we've got a long way to go to get through them. And the Commonwealth public service is um, like Yes Minister on steroids. It is just... You know, it is so incomprehensible the way they work and they just don't understand the nature of engagement, particularly with people who ask them questions all the time and want the answers. So this is new for them, this experience of interacting in this really face-to-face -face way is so new for them. And we're dealing with a department, DSS, who you know, runs Centrelink and they're very busy fending off stuff. So. So there's some politics that are going on that are about the business of the bureaucracy and how it sees itself and what it sees itself responsible for. And it's setting up this new business where there are all these questions and all this stuff. So in some ways what's going to happen is we have to wait for things to play out in order to then insert at the right moment, you know, a piece of advocacy around things. Yeah. But they're going to come a cropper because we all know in this room that they can't do this business without us. We all know that. The problem is, of course, we all go home at five o'clock, most of us, and, and so the people who begin to feel the effects are, of course, our, our clients, people with disabilities, and that's a real problem for us to, to navigate. There's a couple of other things, and just very quickly, Mary, I don't want to take up your time, but, but so... Um, We've got to keep paying attention to who is not in the NDIS because it's only 480,000 people in the NDIS and all of this money went to all people with disabilities. But what the focus is at the moment is the 480,000. We have to keep asking those questions. Who else is being affected by this? Don't let that slip off the agenda. Thanks, Patrick. Um, I think I've used up my time, so any last quick question? Mark. Do you have any quick comment on the Productivity Commission NDIS cost report? No, is the short answer, because, because I haven't had time to read the 372 pages or 532 or whatever it is. I haven't read it properly. I've only read various summaries of it. And uh, the bit I paid most attention to, of course, is what they said about advocacy. And they also said that advocacy funding should continue. All the state governments should continue funding it. So it, that it's another place where they've also still tried to keep putting the pressure on. Um, the, the Productivity Commission report is a, good, is a good example, isn't it, of something that took, you know, they worked on that for, I don't know, a year or more. Lots of people put submissions in. They came and met with us to talk about advocacy, and they did indeed change what they were writing about because of that. Um, the problem is it's a, bit like the, the, it's a bit like all the Senate inquiries and all the other things. You know, the, the, there's a, the uh, NDIS Joint Standing Committee has, at any one time, three or four inquiries running about the NDIS, um, and again, I went to talk to them about advocacy relatively recently, a few weeks ago. Um, the problem is it, there's, a, there's this gap in between it, the time any of those reports come out and the government can choose when it responds to them. So the government isn't impe Just because the Productivity Commission put something out, it doesn't actually mean that the government has to immediately say, oh, yes, yes, we better do that. You know, the Senate inquiry into violence, abuse and neglect against people with disabilities, the perfect example. The government took 15 months to respond to that and then I think most of the recommendations, they just said, noted. Not, not, not we will do anything, but, but oh yes, that, you know, you've got a point. Um, so it, it, it's, this is the difficulty, isn't it, with systemic advocacy. It's, it's, 
the people in this room writing submissions, going to hearings, putting forward, you know, your collected stories and views about things, and then, and then they land into a report, and then you wait. And you don't, you can't know if the government will ever respond and do anything about it. Um, you, you can use the evidence and the pieces out of those reports, you can, you, you can quote them at people, but it, nothing, none of that actually replaces the advocacy that the people in this room can do. None of it. It just... Um, anyway, you, if you would despair if you, if, you, if you thought too deeply about it. You just have to kind of keep your head up and keep going and keep chipping away at things, um, which is why actually the stuff you were talking about earlier about Daru's priorities for next year and um, the stuff, it, it's just... You, you can't, you can't, what you can't do is you can't think just because the Productivity Commission looked at something, oh, we can, we can let go of that now because they did it and that's okay. You actually, you can't afford to. You just have to keep thinking, no, whatever bit I can do in my patch, I have to keep doing it as hard as I can because no, none of that, you know, these big reports still just sit on people's desks and it's still the people in the room who have to use, you know, take quotes out of it and... And, and, you know, so unfortunately, to properly answer your question, Mark, what I literally haven't had time to do is to read through that properly, because this, this is exactly what Dana should do. Read through that properly and pick out all the bits that would be useful for advocates to use in their practice, in their way of quoting back at people and the, in, the, in what they can do in their state, and I just haven't had time to do it. The... the and the Australian National Audit Office brought out another report the day, literally the day after the, the um, uh, Productivity Commission one. Um, and that's a detailed report that's actually, if any, any of you can go and hunt it out, um, it's on the ANAO um, website. And it's, they looked at the, they, what they look, do is they look at the administrative processes of the NDIA. They've just opened another one actually, looking at fraud within the NDIA or yeah, um, but that's the new one they've just opened this week, I think. But that last one, they looked at administrative processes, and there were some interesting things. And I have fed them back to the NDIA, and I've asked the NDIA for responses, and I mentioned them at that joint standing committee. Um, um, one of the examples was they looked at... Um, so it was kind of like they do an audit, basically, of the NDIA. They looked at 150 decisions... Um, decisions, and, and of those 150 access decisions, I think 40, 47 of them were, whatever the term is, access denied or access not approved, or anyway, people were found not eligible to, for access. And the majority of those, so of, of maybe of the ones where access was denied, they had no paperwork. They had nothing on record for no reasons, no, no nothing, no, no paperwork, no nothing at all uh, for about a quarter of those. And of the rest of them, so that was maybe 37 of them, um, they had on file, in theory, what they had on file was what they had sent to the person. Not one of them had they sent a piece of information about their right of review. So, the, so the, that's why the, this trying to keep on top of what the, that agency is doing is incredibly important because just because they're meant to send out something that tells people, you know, so there's some of the organizations have funding for NDIS appeals, but if the NDIA is not telling people that they have a right to reviews and appeals, well, it may be, they might not be approaching organizations to look for the assistance. So anyway, that, that's just one little glimpse into how to, all of the stuff that we have to try and keep on top of to make sure, because nobody else, there's nobody else other than advocates that are, that try and keep systems accountable. You know, you'd imagine, presumably inside the NDIA, somebody, somebody's responsible for making people do their job properly. Um, but, but I feel like they're, they're so busy with all their implementation stuff that, that they don't have time to look backwards. At, Did we do that right? Can we do it better? I think they're just trying to reach their targets. Anyway, that's, yeah. We need more conversations <laughs> to talk about some of these things in depth. I've always said one hour with Mary Madden and I've learned more than I have in a whole year. So thank you very, very much, Mary. Really appreciate it. So we have a break until 2.30. So I'll see you back here at 2.30 for Self-Advocacy Resource Unit.